Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Advocate's Voice. This is the first episode for 2023, and I have a panelist with me, so I will bring everyone in. First, I would like to bring in Mr. Samsul Arafin from Move Malaysia. Hi, Sam. Hi, Nancy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. And then we have Peter Detour from the Vapors Philippines. Hi, Peter. You're muted. <laughs> Hi, guys. Good, good afternoon. <laughs> Hello. Um, next, I'm going to bring in Clarice Regino from the Philippines. Hi, Clarice. Hi, everyone. Then I will bring in Paul Blamar from Australia. Hi, Paul. Afternoon, evening, people. And last but not least, we have Hennage Mitchell from Factasia. Hi, H. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you for the people that are watching. Hi, Rog. Um, I want to start with Sam because we might not have Sam for the entire live. So I have a question for Sam. Um, this is what I wanted to ask you about is in a discussion that we had earlier this week, you were telling us about a situation that was happening in Malaysia and it kind of highlights the paranoia that seems to be rumbling through the tobacco control um, field. So Sam, up to you. Tell us the story of what happened to you. Right. Um... Um, I'm Sam. I'm representing MOVE, the um, consumer group for VIP here in Malaysia and also the uh, program director for Harm Reduction Awareness Association here in Malaysia. And um, we do advocacy work here in Malaysia and obviously it is a non-profit and we put our own time and effort and money into it and uh, we believe that this is a worthy um, cause. We do it because we believe in it. But of course, at the same time, uh, we do have to, you know, take care of ourselves, you know, financially. Uh, we do, do not uh, get any benefits uh, financially from doing the advocacy work. Uh, further than that, we have to put in our, our own resources into it, our time and money. So uh, I, I do have other interests uh, in, in regards to um, my business and uh, my day job, so-called. And uh, I do have other, other uh, few, few businesses that I run, a sports cafe and a digital marketing agency and such. So then um, I was made informed there was a program by the Ministry of Health, which is uh, related to non-communicable disease. So then I set an appointment and I went to see the, um, uh, one of the uh, two of the officers there at the Ministry of Health of Malaysia. And... Um, I brought in a proposal uh, to collaborate with the Ministry of Health um, to, to launch a weight loss program. Okay, a weight loss program that has got nothing to do with vape or any uh, tobacco products. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the propo proposal was hand handed over to them. And I guess it is somewhat of a formality when you do visit their uh, offices they come in and they take pictures and such. All right, so that was that. And um, I was just waiting for them to, to reply in regards to that particular proposal that we wanted to collaborate with the Minister of Health to conduct a weight loss intervention program, right? Which has got nothing to do with it. And then suddenly I was then uh, informed that my visit was in the news it came out in the news and and even more than that it went my picture that was taken with the two officers went viral and um the 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 heading of the news which was all over all over the the media space was no compromise on violation of article 5.3 who sctc by health ministry officials right so then my visit to the Ministry of Health with the intention to collaborate for a health program was then became news by them saying that I am representing a tobacco company and without the knowledge of the um, higher echelon of the MOH uh, officers, uh, namely the ministers herself, uh, has now violated the Article 5.3 of WHO FCTC. So then 
uh, as what Nancy was saying earlier on, uh, I think the level of paranoia is is um, somewhat uh, ridiculous. And um, even in the news article was saying that I, I represent the tobacco company, which is factually untrue. And um, I, I guess that's the, the, the situation that I'm dealing, de dealing with here. And uh, even prior to that, there was a change of government. Um, there was a change of the Minister of Health. And obviously, we have to start over, uh, start all over again our initiative in regards to the regulation of the uh, vape products and the vape industry. And uh, I was, um, before this whole incident, before this whole fiasco, I was uh, contacted by the special advisor to the Minister of Health. Uh, he wanted to see me to discuss about the um, the generational endgame bill that they initiated uh, by the last uh, government. They wanted to revive that again and they wanted to have our input. Now, that on its own was very positive. You know, he reached out to me and wanted to see me, the special advisor of the, the new health uh, minister. But unfortunately, after this um, incident, uh, you know, when, that went viral, stating that my visit over to the MOH violated the Article 5.3 of the WHO FCTC. Uh, I don't think uh, he'll be seeing me anytime soon. So I guess um, uh, in, in, that's the gist of it, Nancy. That's what was happening. You know, it's interesting to me because we've been dealing with um, 5.3 the misinterpretation of 5.3 here in New Zealand as well. All right. Yeah, independent vape manufacturers were trying to get a hold of our regulatory authority, our vaping regulatory authority, and they got bounced back because they were told that, you know, under 5.3, they can only just talk to and, and discuss these things with tobacco companies. So it seems that what's going on with 5.3, this, this, there's this campaign for let's interpret 5.3 to suit our own purposes that has absolutely nothing to do with 5.3. Right, now, I, right. know, I know that Paul, in Australia, there's been drama over there with this as well. Paul, he doesn't no, even before that, can, can, can I just add on one more point? Yeah. Which is, I think, is important and it's very damaging to our progress here in Malaysia. I was informed there's a circulation of, of um, uh, internal letters uh, within the Ministry of Health stating that I am barred from entering MOH unless I am invited by the Minister of Health herself. So that's where we are at right now. Yeah, it, it's the paranoia. I mean, and, and it's it's ramping up and obviously it's a copier. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I still think about that. I'm just like, I roll, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. I mean, it's just, it's insane. You know, it's absolutely insane. Um, I would like to switch to, uh, Paul's just shaking his head no. So I would like to switch to H as he sits there and he's drinking something. Hello. Hi, H. Unmute. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> now, what's your take on all of this? <clears throat> Well, it's not surprising. Uh, I think we've, we, you know, we've we've been the target for the uh, anti-THR uh, brigade for a long time. Uh, I think it's, yeah, as I say, it's not it's not unsurprising. Uh, they do say that as one door closes, another one opens, uh, and I would reiterate what I've said numerous times, which is that if the Department of Health is locked into bad science, rhetoric, and moralistic prohibitionist dogma, and is using the flawed science that they do, uh, retracted studies, that studies that are not peer-reviewed, studies that just don't stand up to any scrutiny, uh, and which are completely uh, blasted out of the water by studies by independent peer-reviewed researchers who are highly qualified, if the Department of Health wants to use that to justify their position, then dealings with regulators have to point out that this information that they're providing is an opinion. It is not backed up by any evidence. The evidence that they have come up with is flawed and highly contentious. If this was a court of law, the case would be thrown out because the evidence is clearly insufficient. 
uh, and, and highly con contentious. There's a lot of other evidence there. So consequently, if you're talking to DH, uh, DOH as a regulator, the um, the onus is on the DH, DOH actually to prove what they're saying, and they can't. Consequently, there's a lot of other uh, stakeholders who are skin in the game. Uh, there's the Department of uh, uh, Trade and Industry. There's the uh, Bureau of Revenue. There's the Customs Department. There's the Tourist Department. They've all got a skin in the game. And they all may have different attitudes on how vaping uh, tobacco harm reduced products uh, could bolster the economy, could lead uh, um, small businesses to, to some kind of success could uh, look at export markets and so on and so forth. Uh, so the Department of Health position is invariably in every country in this region and pretty much uh, most countries is totally beholden to the WHO's uh, rhetoric. Um, they don't bother to do research. They, they, they just don't need to because the WHO has told them to do this. Consequently, I think it's time, way past time, that we just stop walking in the Department of Health. They're not going to change their mind. They're bought and paid for. Um, we need to be addressing this uh, with uh, other government departments and uh, finding regulators, politicians who are actually got a, a, a logic vein in them, who understand rational debate, reason, facts, evidence. Uh, you don't need to be a scientist to understand that if you've got three quarters of the research that says this is 95% safer and has all been peer reviewed and 25% or less that says it's not and it's not been peer reviewed and it's been attracted. I think we know which way the science is going. It's just we're not being presented with it by the Department of Health. So it's up to us to present the correct science, well, the, the full uh, spectrum of it to regulators and to encourage uh, uh, government officials to talk to other departments of the Department of Health. And that's that's what I've got to say about it. Yeah, I mean, and there's another thing, too. And this is Paul. You're definitely going to have to answer this one. OK, because this happened in Australia is that, you know, now they've gotten to the point and I'm giving the paranoia. I'm still on paranoia thread here. They've gotten to the point where people who are doing independent analysis of science and presenting it, if any of that science contains anything that they consider dubious because of funding, they go after and they attack people. Now, Paul, this happened in Australia. I want you to give everybody an update of what happened there, please. Okay, that's quite easy to, you know, put in the words. Uh, a few days ago, the Australian a newspaper here in Australia tore, tore apart a lot of the um, submissions that have just been put in for another consultation period. And they're specifically going after two of our biggest advocates, one being Dr. Alex Wodak and the other one being Dr. Colin Mendelson. They claim that all of the, all of the, all of this, okay. They claim that all of the science that's been done by PMI, BAT, JP, all of it is complete and utter rubbish and it shouldn't be used or even put forward. Now, we've just been through another consultation period after the prescription model was introduced in 2021. Now they're doubling down and wanting plain packaging, nicotine limits, also flavor, flavor bands. It, it's gone from one end of extreme to completely out of control here. Anyone that's associated with the vaping industry or with tobacco harm reduction, is now being tarred with the same brush that we all work for big tobacco in one way, shape or form. That's in it in a nutshell. Big tobacco harm reduction. Here's my thing. Um, how do we get beyond this? How, because, you know, obviously they're trying to silence us. <laughs> they're scared. We know this. But how do we... Um, you know, using the kids, one of the things, I'm just going to have a little rant here. One of the things that's really gotten to me in the last couple of months is this children, the children, the children. And I'm sure we've all heard enough about it, okay? And now, of course, in the States, they're hiding, hiding stats because the stats are actually showing that the youth, the youth vaping rate is dropping. Why is it 
that we as adults are we you know do they consider us lost causes so to hell with you we don't care what happens to you how do we get around that and make the average person understand that what's happening to us is something that could happen to them it might not be tobacco it might not be vaping that this this switch this shift okay from you know these people who are our public health people and they're supposed to be responsible for us it's turned into some kind of paternalistic thing but we're going to tell you what to do and if you don't do things our way well then pff, how do we address that does anybody have any thoughts on that Um, I'll just chime in very quickly. Uh, I think the uh, the reason many of us uh, are, are here is because we're passionate about something that's that's improved our lives. Uh, we're subjective about it, but if you look at uh, the average human being, uh, the, the the concept of the human condition, we enjoy things that are not necessarily good for us. We all do, whether you spoke or vape or not, whether you absolutely think smokers deserve everything they get because who in their right wire would stick something in their own lungs. Coca-Cola, soft drinks, sugar, booze, uh, fried foods, fast foods, uh, all this kind of stuff that many everybody enjoys. Jollibee in the Philippines. There's nothing there's nothing healthy in, in Jollibee. So why aren't we why aren't these antis going and closing that down? That's not real food, but they don't. But they will if we let them get away with this. So this is the thin end of the wedge. Uh, and I think it, it's, it's, it's important that we get the general public to understand you may not be a smoker of vapor, but they're coming after us because of something that, that we started when we were kids. You guys started eating chocolates and candies and chips and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff when you were kids. It wasn't good for you then, and it's not good for you now. Um, so how should we approach this? Should we educate people that eating chips and fast food is not good? Or should we ban it? Which one should we do? If it was your choices that are now on the block, how would you feel about it? So we need to get some kind of synergy and sympathy and, you know, get people to understand we're human beings too. OK, yeah, we're not monsters because we started smoking. I think everybody in this room started smoking when they were kids. I know I did. I was nine when somebody gave me the first cigarette. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> um, and here no, I am no. much, much no. older, 60 years on. And I don't smoke. I vape. But I smoked for 50 years of my life. And yeah. it gave me huge health issues. And now I, I don't have those health issues. They're under control. Thank you very much. If you switch from drinking soft drinks to drinking water or sugar-free drinks, you will see an improvement in your health. Everybody knows this. If you switch from smoking to vaping or heat not burn, you will see a significant improvement in your health. We know this. Mm -hmm. But other people don't understand it. So if you put it into context, if you stop eating white bread and start eating soda bread, you're going to see a benefit. You will feel that benefit. If you start eating white rice and eat brown rice, you'll feel the benefit. This is the same thing. This is switching from something that's harmful to something that's less harmful. And we all see the benefits in that. So putting it into terms that a non-smoker or a non-vapor can understand, I think, is important. That's how you're going to get the, the sympathy, if you will. Which brings up another question, and I want to I want to direct this one at Clarice. Clarice, in the Philippines, you guys now have a regulated market. They're working on the actual nuts and bolts of it. How do people in the Philippines, the jo John Q. Public or Joan Q. Public in the Philippines, how do they view vaping and how do they view tobacco harm reduction? Hi. Um, yeah. So now we do have the vape law, which we are, I, I, I consider ourselves very lucky to get to this point, actually, because looking at other um, LMICs in the Southeast Asia region or the Asia Pacific region, we really are indeed lucky. Um, as to the vape law, um, I'm not going to discuss it anymore. It's uh, it's very legalese to discuss it. But anyway, um, I think it is um, directed towards protecting those who would like to switch from combustible um, cigarettes, from smoking cigarettes to uh, switching to vape. And I think right now, um, most people are 
still not that informed regarding vaping because I for for someone in my age, I do use a lot of social media and um I do see how people um react to what tobacco harm reduction is. And despite the fact that we do have we do have the vape law right now, there are still people trying to um spread fake news regarding tobacco harm reduction and sometimes they sometimes this information even come from doctors from someone from people who are experts and you'd think to yourself how is someone like a doctor um say stuff like this because people would respect you if you're a doctor people would actually listen to you heavily if you are a doctor you have that kind of standing and um it's unfortunate that despite having a regulation um which is aimed to protect public health um we still have people who do not really fully understand or absorb uh what tobacco harm reduction is and what it can do to help people so yeah yeah, it, it, it there does seem to be this great big disconnect, and it, and I would I would I would say there's a wall, okay, and there, there's that wall in the media, and only certain voices get through, and it's only if they serve those certain masters, let's put it that way. Um, so we've got the disinformation, we've got misinformation, then we've got disinformation. I mean, and I personally perceive that as misinformation is you don't actually know, but you're just spouting stuff. Disinformation is you're intentionally spouting the wrong information. So we've got those two aspects that are happening, right? How do we counter that? And that's my question for Peter. Well, that's a tough one. Um, I think we just have to continue with what we're doing. Um, just piggybacking on what you said earlier, um, the so-called experts uh, forces us or forces people uh, who does not understand the big picture to simply look at specific things. Using the tools that you said earlier, uh, misinformation, disinformation, and all that, targeting specific groups or specific individuals. As like what Clarice said earlier, yeah, we have a law here but uh, we still have a long ways to go because not everybody understands it. Um, right now, most individuals here in my country, the Philippines, the way they look at uh, harm reduction in general, the vape law per se, is just like this. What is being told them and what they read in the news. So I think what we need to do is make them see it like this. And we do that by continuously doing forums like this continuously uh, sharing the the different studies that uh, we come across to, like what H said earlier, those studies that has been vetted, peer-reviewed, and uh, real studies. Because uh, if we have groups or individuals that uh, follow certain commands uh, by their so-called masters, to they, they themselves are looking at, at this. So I think uh, as uh, passionate advocates, it is our job to make sure that it doesn't stop there. We just have to keep on move, opening the eyes of those people uh, a centimeter at a time. And uh, we might not be able to switch during our lifetime, but we, we have to keep on doing it. Uh, Nancy, I, I think that's, that's, that's the, that's the, plan that I can come up with to continuously combat that and um, to be very specific about it is we have to answer the the, the online uh, or whatever messaging the, the, the other groups are trying to do because if we allow them to do that plus the fact that uh, because they're doctors or certain so-called experts a lot of people will take what they say on the face value um, so I think we just need to continue on answering back and giving the people the right information. Yeah, I agree. We've got a question and it's from Mallory in the state. So this is very U.S. centric because I don't think we've dealt with the issues that they have with the THC. But 
She wants to know how many figures include THC vaping under nicotine vaping. Um, she's saying, we know a lot can't seem to separate the two. How many on the panel have um, Colin's book, um, Stop Smoking, Start Vaping, as facts for your government? Now, I want to address this, and then I'll hand it back to you guys. Yeah, there's Paul, of course, Australian. Um, I do have the book. My government doesn't need the book. But um, the THC vaping versus nicotine vaping, we don't have that big issue with that here in New Zealand. I don't know if they do anywhere else. I mean, hell, it's legal in Thailand. I, whatever. We're not going there. Um, so that tends to be a very U.S. thing with let's break out the THC versus the nicotine. So I don't have an answer for you, Mallory, but I'm going to turn it over to everybody else in case they may have an answer for you. So anybody want to take that up? They're actually misidentifying a lot of the devices. A lot of the photos that you're seeing, they're pulling them together between regular vaping devices and THC cartridges, but they're putting them all into the same bracket. And I think the figures, I think you're right there, Mallory, that some of the figures they're actually throwing in the THC data as well. If they find a device or a cartridge or a tank or whatever it might be, they're adding that into the same bracket. They're not differentiating between the different products. That's my take on it. I mean, in, in the Philippines, do you guys have that issue as well with the THC vaping that you're aware of? No, we, we, we don't have that uh, much here in the Philippines. There was one before, but later on, um, it, it, it wasn't really, just really no connection at all. Okay. So uh, not, not a big, uh, not really something that Filipinos talk about here in the Philippines. I, yeah, I don't no. know if. Yeah, I think, no. I think I mean, if I could just chime in there yes, in please. the Philippines, if, if you were to say, oh, I've got a THC vape pen the death squads would be on your doorstep within moments. So it's not something that you would actually talk about. Uh, and that, that would be the case in most countries. Uh, in countries where THC is, is now legal, which is some, some states in the US, um, Thailand, it's, 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 it's completely legal. Um, but uh, in, uh, in the US, uh, it's always been a, 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 something that, uh, it amuses me somehow that that uh, the THC pens are endemic. They're all over the place and completely accepted. So in California, I guess, you can wander around the streets vaping a vape pen, but you can't have a flavoured nicotine vape. What? Yeah. What? Uh, hello? Um, what? <laughs> you know. So I think I think there's there's a huge disconnect. At, at everywhere we look, there's a massive disconnect between public health. Um, uh, 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 regulators or so-called experts, um, uh, bureaucrats, and public health. Uh, there's a disconnect between uh, manufacturers and consumers. There's a disconnect between consumers and governments. There's a disconnect between uh, regulatory frameworks that allow THC marijuana, but ban nicotine vaping and, and, and less harmful products. There's a disconnect between the the, 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 the taxes that are charged on uh, legal products versus what the harm of these products actually are. Indonesia, where, where the cost of uh, a vape, which is not particularly popular anymore, is <laughs> at the highest possible tax bracket for a cigarette. There is no incentive whatsoever to try to switch to something that costs more than the poison that you're already taking. There's no sense to it. So there's a disconnect in, in the minds of public, uh, of regulators between the evidence and the rhetoric. So it's a massive challenge, but I think if we recognize that this, those disconnects exist and point them out, uh, uh, here, here's here's a classic example of a disconnect. I'm going to hold up. I'm going to hold my phone up to the to the uh, uh, to the camera, and um, th this is. I know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> hold it. Bring it up. Up uh, there. Do you see that, people? That With is police officers. Policemen who are implicit 
as a police force in shaking down people that vape because because look carefully they're vaping hello right so uh, my son was walking down the road the other day and he had a vape on him and he, oops there's a cop there and he put it away as he walked past it and the cop went blew a huge crowd of, of vape out i mean it, it's one it's one rule for them and one rule for us uh, and it's oh, unacceptable yeah. but i think pointing out this kind of thing just serves to show that the citizens of, of, of our respective countries these people do this stuff but they won't let you have it these people will say one thing but they're not actually talking about anything that's relevant to the issues because what they're using as justification doesn't stand up to scrutiny yeah i mean so i've got you have, to, you have to just point out these disconnects and keep doing it so does this make sense to anyone else it makes sense well, i've got me. i've got three statements here that we're going to discuss <laughs> um from the hypocrisy files as a matter of fact number one they tell us there's not enough evidence for vaping and it's not around long enough but here take the covid jab trust us that's one number two we're going to ban the safer alternative, but we're going to allow tobacco to continue to be sold. And three, they're taxing you to punish you for not doing what they want, for not stopping smoking the way they want you to do. I think these are all very true statements, and I think it's in, it's so deeply embedded, especially the last two, are so yeah. deeply embedded in tobacco control that it's like, you know, David and Goliath, it's, you know, you just pushing effluent uphill. But in saying that, there's another thing that I have recently heard that we need to discuss, I think. And we've been asking for years to get a discussion around Article 1.D in the, in the Framework Treaty, and that is harm reduction. Now, the, the word on the street is that they are, in fact, going to discuss harm reduction at this COP that's coming up in November in Panama. This is a worry, people, because if they're going to use the Australian version of harm reduction, they're going to be pushing for medicalized vaping and medicalized nicotine. OK, and if you look at the rhetoric that's out there and you look at all the propaganda that's out there, the misinformation, the disinformation, it's kind of simple to see that that's where they're going to go. So we've got to figure out how we're going to counter that. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? H. I think it would be useful if every consumer advocacy on the planet wrote to their uh, respective departments of health and bureaucrats that are handling the uh, um, delegations to the FCTC to insist that they put a consumer advocate on the delegation from each country so that we're represented at a country state at a country level at fctc not us applying to fctc to get in as observer but telling governments that you're doing this there's consumers involved and it's all about consumers it's all about us we need to be represented on the on, on your delegation i think that's that's something we could usefully do who knows some countries might even say yeah that makes sense they might they might. I mean, do you think in the Philippines that that will be a possibility, Peter or Clarice? Um, definitely, Nancy. I, I think uh, for the most part, even though there, there's a lot of consumer groups here in the Philippines, uh, there are also a lot of uh, business groups, particularly with vaping. Um, I totally agree with what H is saying. Um, it has to be a consensus effort by a lot of individuals to make that happen. And uh, I think it's high time for us here in the Philippines, at least the leaders with respect to the consumer groups, the, the business sectors, the PCAs, and uh, all the other uh, groups out there to band together and to come up with one action plan to make sure that uh, the harm reduction advocates here in the Philippines gets a seat on that table. Um, I think we can do it, but uh, I have to talk to a lot of uh, organizations so that uh, all our efforts will be in harmony towards a particular goal. Yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, and that's, I agree with you, H, you know, and that's something that we're going to be pushing um, 
in our region. By the way, in case you didn't know, uh, this is something that we're going to be pushing in our region in the next like four weeks, just getting those letters out there and saying, hey, listen, you need to have a consumer on us because, you know, on that on that delegation, because this is about us. Um, I'm not sure how effective it will be, but I think if enough people do it and enough people demand it, it's going to make them think. Um, because right now, some of the things that we've been noticing is they are watching us. They do see what we're doing. They are paying attention to what we're doing. And the more that we do, the scared, more scared they get. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting um, endeavor to see how many of us actually make it to Panama with our country delegations. La, Mallory wanted to clarify that in California, you can vape flavored nicotine. You just can't buy it in California. So you have to ship it in. So I just want to clarify that. Um, so here we go. Um, when we're talking about the people that are attacking us and the people who are the messengers of disinformation, where do we draw the line between not getting involved in those arguments and carrying on and just trying to spread the right information and the, and the right science? I tend to think that a lot of times they do these things because they're just trying to muddy the waters and get us off track. What do you guys think? Paul? For, the mo for the most part, they're trying to discredit anyone that has any knowledge or any sense, regardless if you're part of the industry or you're an advocate, they're trying to discredit anything that we put forward to them. Australia is a prime example. When the prescription model was introduced, it was a failure from the get go. It wasn't thought out. It wasn't put together in the right way. No one from the vaping industry or tobacco harm reduction were actually involved in the process. I think it was a pet project put together by um, our former health minister, Greg Hunt, the now former head of the TGA, being Professor Skerritt. They're both now gone. We don't know what's going to happen with the TGA. And for anyone that wants to know, the TGA is the equivalent of the FDA in the United States. They control medicines here in Australia. Now we need to see what we can do here first and foremost, because I think a lot of people are looking to Australia and what the, what the model has been put forward. The model's not working. It's an absolute failure. I think we need to go... A little bit further and i hope to be in panama this year i really do because the the pushback that we've got coming from government and from the health departments is quite horrifying yeah no it is i mean and, and i think as we have to you know as adults you know, we fight for every, our children, we fight for our parents, we fight for all these things, but, you know, nobody's going to fight for us, so we have to fight for ourselves. I mean, that's it. And just stay very focused and stay, you know, on on message. I guess H likes to say, stay on message. Stay on message, okay? And the message is this, you know, we have rights. You are not our parent. You know, you have no right to tell us how we should do things and how we shouldn't do things, you know? We have a right to harm reduction. We have a right to health. And just present that message in the best possible way that we can so that the general public understands they're coming after us today. They'll be coming after you tomorrow. I mean, would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, it's yeah. the thin end of the wedge. Yeah, you know. So as we start to wrap this up, I'm going to ask each one of you to give us just a brief statement on your thoughts on misinformation, disinformation, bad science, and Myrna Copier. Where do you want to see us at when that cop is done? And it's the beginning of November. Where do you want to see us at? I'm going to start with you, Peter. Um, to everyone out there uh, watching and listening, um, there's a lot of things going around. Um, all I ask is for everybody to listen. Um, read everything, but like what my good colleague here, Paul and H and uh, Sam and then Clarice said earlier, it insults our common sense to a certain extent. Uh, don't believe everything that you said 
uh, uh, oh, sorry, don't believe everything that you hear and that you read. Remember, it's your life. Uh, read through it, understand. If you have any questions, if something's not, it doesn't add up, most probably it will not. So uh, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'll be more than happy to, you know, uh, give you the science that we have and uh, engage in meaningful dialogue. As for uh, COP November 1, hopefully, we see a lot of people in this particular uh, uh, advocate's voice to be there in uh, Panama, God willing, with the help of everybody. We will surely work hard to make sure that your voices will be heard. Not just any voice, but the right voice. Thanks for that, Peter. That's good. I'm going to... Clarice, you're up. Hi. Um, so, yeah, as to misinformation and disinformation, um, just like what Peter said, let's not be gullible no? in um, just taking in whatever we read or whatever we hear on uh, social media or wherever. Um, we have to question, we have to keep on questioning whether these things that we hear and read are accurate. And as to COP, I, I also do um, hope that we get the proper representation that we need, uh, like to have a seat at the table, because it is about us after all. It is about people protecting people's rights. And I do hope that what we want to air could also be aired right from us, not just from other people, but from consumer advocates and consumer consumers themselves. So yeah, um, I think um, it's a big challenge to topple down uh, misinformation and disinformation in particular. But we have to be consistent in providing the accurate information and um, letting people know that this is something that we are we have been fighting for, um, for quite some time now, and that it's going to benefit a lot of people in the long run. Thanks for that, Clarice. Paul, you're up next. It's it's tough being here in Australia where we've got some of the most draconian laws on the planet when it comes to vaping and tobacco harm reduction. Yes, we were a leader once upon a time, but now we're becoming the laughing stock on the world stage. They're doubling down on everything that we're trying to do here from both the industry advocacy and science they won't listen to any of it all i can say is the truth is out there we know the truth we're part of the truth and we're part of the solution and this year i think because of cop and what they're going to be talking about and going over i think it's time that every single member country of the FCCC and their delegates, they do need a consumer next to them that has been in the trenches fighting for years to help them understand that science is real, it's not bought. You, you can't change what has been found and how the studies have been put together the science is real we're real we're real people we're not numbers we're real people and vaping pretty much helped save my life you know diagnosed with emphysema now no puffers nothing i'm good to go but yeah. please to the rest of the world do not look at the australian model it failed from the get-go failed yeah. as soon as they rolled it out of the gate please don't yeah. look at it please don't yeah fair enough h your turn okay guys. well um in terms of how do you counter misinformation and disinformation uh, i think i think depending on how it's presented is going to give you some clues as to what 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 the what the fight back is but i think one thing is very, uh, a couple of things that I, I think are worth remembering. Number one, 
we're looking for respectful engagement. We're not looking to have confrontation with anti-THR people. Let's just assume that they're misguided. Uh, we all have our ideas uh, as to why this has happened, the funding and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, well, let's just assume that the people, most of them that, that we're trying to engage with are actually want the same things as we want. Uh, ultimately, we want to see an end to cigarette smoking. We want to see an end to the death and disease and misery that uh, combustible tobacco causes around the world. That's what we want. We all want that. So we, that there's, that we don't actually, the only thing we disagree with the anti-THR brigade, the Bloombergs and, and the rest of them, is that THR is valid. That's the only thing we disagree with. So that's our point. We have to keep hammering that home. When people start throwing bad science at us, then, yeah, you can say, yeah, well, he says that, but look, here's, there's, uh, if you go, I think CAFRA has on their website, uh, uh, perhaps Nancy can share the link, uh, a comparison of bad science and, and, you know, reasonable science, let's call it like, uh, where all the stuff that the antis are using is there, but all the stuff that negates that, and there's much more of it, is there, it's searchable and whatever. So that's a resource that can be used. But again, at the end of the day, it's it's politicians and regulators that pass the laws that, that we are all beholden to. And they pass them based on best information and best best knowledge. They're not scientists. They're not going to look at the science and research. They're just going to what's been put in front of them. So as I said earlier, we're not scientists. We can't sit there and debate the science and the people that we need to debate it with being the regulators. They can't debate it either because by and large, they're not scientists. What we have to point out is, look, you're being told this. Here's what you're being told. That's that much information. Here's the information that negates that. The other research that's been done by independent people who won't pay to come up with, you know, the results that sit with the prohibitionist mindset. So that 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 that's you know, one way of doing it is to say the science that you're being presented with by this group does not match the science that the other groups have. So there's clearly doubt there. So you have an opinion, uh, but you can't back it up with facts. The evidence that you have is very flawed. So the evidence we have is not so flawed. But at the end of the day, regardless of what the evidence is, we're human beings, we're consumers, we're the voters, we're the people that have found this product that has saved our lives, that has improved our health, that has improved the health of everyone around us. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking for myself here. I, I wouldn't be here if I was still smoking. I'm vaping. I'm still here. Sorry. Uh, but that's the way it is. But there's millions of stories like this. Millions in every single country where vaping is, is, is used. Um, this is the principal leverage that we have. There are millions and millions of us. This stuff works for us. If you've got fears and concerns about it, that's fine. Make sure that what we are able to access conforms to manufacturing standards that make sense. But do not tell us what we can and can't put into our bodies when you're selling us, allowing us to buy cigarettes, which will kill us and which make you millions and millions, if not billions of pounds and dollars and cents and pesos and whatever. So... From the point of view of a consumer approaching the regulators, the science is somewhat secondary to this is us, this is what we want, this is what we need, and it's your job to make sure that we get it and that what we get is manufactured effectively. That's all your job is, not to ban it, not to empower the black market, not to disrespect people that choose to have chosen to to use tobacco or nicotine. Uh, and it's not your job to understand the science either. It's your job to pass regulation that allows us to have access to these products that satisfy what we want so that we can continue to have a life and improve our health. And you don't have to support us in your health system if you have one. This is about us. It's not about tobacco control. It's not about, ultimately, it's about us and the choices that we make and the decisions that we make and the things we do to improve our own health. We're not asking for help. We just want to have access. That's it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, my take on this is people need to have the information so that they can make an informed decision. And 
if you're in the way of that, get the hell out of the way because now you're committing a crime. You are really, I mean, you have no right. You know, do we live in, yeah, I, I get speechless when I think about it. I could start ranting, but I'm not going to go there because we're not going to do that because they just said we had to be respectful. So um, you'll notice, see, I do listen sometimes. Um, on the bottom, I have a sticker going. The TAV live sessions are going to start up next month, and it's going to be Lindsay and Skip and myself. And we're going to have, um, for the first one, we're going to have Martin Cullop there. And the focus of everything this year is going to be top 10. So if you can, keep an eye out for that because Martin is going to give some really good information about what you can do either as a group or as an individual, as a consumer, as an adult, okay, to fight for your right to have access to these, these products and your right to health. So I just want to do a little put that in there for everybody so they can know about it. Um, the promos and stuff will be showing up probably in the next two weeks. And last but not least, I want to thank my panelists. Sam, you're not there, but I'm going to thank you online anyway. Um, thank you to Peter, to Clarice, to Paul, and to H. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Thank you, everybody in the audience, for joining us. And we will be seeing you guys soon. So I want everybody to just stay safe, stay well, and we'll catch up on, on the flip side. Thank you.